are still um, filtering in quite a bit. Give another minute or two. Let's get up. Yep, still more people coming in. Yep. Standing room only. We would probably have this in the school, except they're having a rehearsal in the school. And right. Maybe the next, maybe the next one, in the school. So I'm going to open this um, informational meeting on April 29th of 2024, which has been posted in three public places and on the website and emailed to interested parties, so we can. This is a legally warned um, meeting that is basically um, informational about the whole topic of what to do with the former high school building. Um, we have to give a lot of thanks to the committee that has stepped up and helped the select board uh, investigate um, possibilities and um, gather information. It's been four years. I think yeah. four years <laughs> we've been studying on this. Um, Pat's been really involved with that committee, and she can um, speak to the um, the extent to which they've they've dug deep about what are possibilities. It's not um, the only possibilities for the school. That's we're here to gather your your um, suggestions, impressions, feedback. We're not making any decisions. We early on the select board decided that this is not a decision the three of us are going to make. This is a decision that the town is going to make. So it's we're going to have a vote and it's been kicked off down the down the road um, a while. It'll probably happen this summer sometime. We have not set a date, but um, we have as more things um, un have unfolded like the analysis of the you know the um, any kind of contamination in the building. We just wanted to make sure that as much information was available as possible for you people to vote on this, and, and we get to vote too, but um, on, on what to do with this, this building. Um, as we know, it, it was not, necess not necessarily the, um, the, the desires of the town to close that building. This was forced upon us um, by the state, you know, um, it was built to be a school. Um, my personal feeling is that it should should be a school, but that's neither here nor there. We're, we, you know, maybe that's down the line. But um, the um, the committee is not only investigated um, options and possibilities of how it could be repurposed, but they've also succeeded in finding money, a fairly significant amount of money. The Analysis for the an initial stabilization of the building to address um, uh, critical needs like the heating system and the HVAC and the roof is what just over three million dollars, three point one million dollars, I believe. Plus and windows and doors and other, and other right, aspects. Right. Yeah, that. sundry. Yeah. And with a um, and uh, thirty-five percent um, um, inflation adjustment figured into that. So it's. Um, it's an educated guess about what it would take, and this by no means what it would the final, what the building needs. But this would make it, um, bring it current, and and address a lot of the um, undealt with maintenance that has happened over the since the 70s when it was built. Um, so what we're going to do, we have so many people in here, we're going to hear from people in the room first, and then we'll move on to people in Zoom, and we'd like to keep it down to like, you know, three minutes of conversation or, 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 or talk. Um, really encourage you to listen to what people say. I know a lot of people have very specific things that they want to say, and, and we'll get those out, but also um, this is to educate and, and be open to, to hearing um, what people say. Does, um, what do you guys, do you have anything you want to add to this? There are some, we have uh, Vic and Catherine here, which have been spearheading this project since we asked them, uh, what do you think we could do with the building? And uh, they stuck, stuck with it through all this time. And then, and then we said, well, uh, how can we achieve the goal after they had the meeting? Um, where the townspeople all got together and, and put their wish list together on what the building could become for them. And then, then we charged them with trying to figure out um, how could we make that work. So the committee became uh, a, a 
funding seeking committee and uh, went through a lot of different processes. They, they're, they're now very knowledgeable about floodplains and Act 250 and <laughs> uh, contamination and every, all umbra umbrellas and all sorts of letters that, you know, it's, <laughs> the, the letters are endless. Um, See, it's a school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, these two folks are the ones that have been with it all along. I've always, I've always done my best to join in with their progress. Um, they also have subcommittees of some people that are also in the town, which they may call upon. Um, and uh, so we can take it from there. A lot of the questions you may or may not have could be posed to Vic or Catherine or the select board, or you could just voice your concerns to each other without yelling. <laughs> I think one other thing that's important is this is not a yes or no vote for this building, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's really what do we do with it, at an honest appraisal of it, what do we do with it. Whether it's a school building or a town-owned building, how do we deal with it? And if the select board is put in a position to deal with it, it's going to be a real nightmare for three of us to handle. And if the town office is going to be the one that's going to be responsible for the paperwork, it certainly isn't going to be to their advantage. It's certainly going to put a lot more stress on their job. So I think we, an honest discussion needs to take place on what we can do with it, how it can work, or if it can't work. But we need to be honest with ourselves about it. And that's really about all there is to it. But a yes and no vote is not going to solve this thing. It's not going to put it one way or another. So That just starts it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we need to defuse that and make sure that we're not trying to fight each other here about that. We just need to understand, is it going to work whatever we do for the long term of the, the benefit of the community? All right, Larry, you can start off. Um, real quick, what's the final cost of this building? If it's $3 million to stabilize it, what's all in? Thank you. Oh, we don't have a final number on that. $3.1 million was an estimate as of 2022 to upgrade all those systems. Uh, the building envelope, the heating system, uh, fire alarm, uh, windows, doors, uh, etc. And some, left, and some. What's left that's going to come up? That's the envelope, the building envelope. Well, no, and some interior work, and some uh, um, handicap accessibility uh, improvements. Uh, but until we get a little more deeper into the actual occupancy of it, and learn more about how the building would be used, uh, there's more to come. And and also, I, I guess, would um, reiterate that that's what a 2022 number. We get into construction in 2025. That's more money inflation. So there's more to be learned about how much it's going to cost and what exactly additional work needs to be done. Thank you. Um, Frank and then Jeff. I, I, I just wanted to um, express a word of thanks to uh, um, for, the, for the folks who put together the package for Senator Sanders such that he came through with an earmark of 2.3 million for the town of Rochester to repurpose its old high school building into a community center. And I'm sure that's, um, I don't know, I, I'm sure Catherine had a lot to do with putting that package together. Probably about 99.5%. Um, <laughs> 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 it's a, it's, it's, it's really a team effort. There is no one person. Yeah. It's a total team effort. And it has to be a town, a town effort, a town <laughs> project now. It's something that if the town votes for, we will go forward with it. But we recognize this is not a Vic and Catherine in the steering committee. We've done what we've done to now, and we are extremely lucky to have the support of Senator Sanders. And the state agencies, we're on all their radars now, and they can't even believe that such a small town got so much money. Yeah. And so, but that's because Senator Sanders did call us and speak with us. He, he loves this project, and he loves this town. So, so I'd like to make a, an interesting point here that this money that has been um, accessed um, remarkably so is because it's been applied for through the town, through the municipality. Mm -hmm. A school district was not um, able to apply for that and if it was um, 
the eventual what we're looking at if there was a nonprofit organization formed to run this entity whatever it is they would not be able to apply that for this so what the town would be in my understanding would be a, a transitory vehicle that can access money and then um, the project can move forward I, I talked with um, folks in Wilmington who have gone through this process with their high school and they ended up not the town did not buy it but they sold it to a, a, a 501c3 corporation that formed to take on the building and consequently it's been a long lingering challenge to access the money to do the upgrades that they have done to the building so the fact that the um you know the town has the opportunity this not decided yet this is still going to be a vote you know if the town votes that we don't want to buy the building then this money goes poof so this town this money is the town's it was yeah. passed into law on march 9th by this congress remarkably and uh we have five years to spend the money so I think that Nancy Woolley was concerned about the length of time we have to spend the money. We have five years to spend the money, and that gives us time, and we're also raising additional money as we go along. We've also established a 501c3. Well, it's a nonprofit now, and we're filing with the IRS, the uh, Valley Hub, <coughs> Inc. That's Vic's uh, project, and so we'll be able to raise significant more funds. We have a, a community development block grant right now being reviewed for a half a million. We got a $300,000 anonymous donation for someone who is very uh, grateful to the town. This was a quote for all the town has given to them and they wanted to give back to the town. And so I think there is interest and I think there is funding that we don't even know about that's going to be coming into this town. But that Sanders money passed into law for, the, for Rochester. It is Rochester's money, and if by some miracle we upgrade the building without spending the $3.1 million but less, it's still the town's money. No one's going to ask you to refund the money. So that, I think, is kind of a reassuring fact. Uh, I, I never hear about the flip side. The flip side. We always hear about how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. We never hear about how much it's going to cost if we do nothing. Mm -hmm. The so estimate if, if to you, tear down the building was about a million dollars, which there's no grant money for. We'd have to... So that goes on our individual taxes for the next 20 years, yes. as if you're buying a new school. Yeah. A million dollars, 20 yeah. years bonding for it. Yes. Yeah. yes. As opposed to grant money, which is a gift, so to speak. Yeah. Which we've done at the federal level already, so it's a nice yeah. way to get money back. <laughs> One way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, but in the back, Freya, you had a question? Oh, and I'm sorry, Jeff, you're just short down there. Yeah. I guess we have three choices, perhaps more. Perhaps um, more, yeah. If we repurpose the building, it's $3.1 million. Um, if we don't repurpose the building and we decide to tear it down, that's a million dollars. If we don't do anything, what happens then? Do the school districts, Rochester, Rochester and Stockbridge, continue to support the school financially? It, it is. A, it's a school building, you know, it, it will remain to be so until um, they either sell it to us or someone else. Um, what they would do if they did put it on the market for a while or tried to they tried to they didn't really find a realtor that wanted to pick up a thirty thousand yeah. plus square foot building yeah, so. yeah. 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 shed some light on her right no everything you're saying is, is exactly correct um should we come back to the third option that uh it's back in the school's hands to decide what they need to do then it's going to be the school board that's going to need to sit down and really analyze what we can do with it. Um, we don't have a lot of options. We're in the business of educating kids, not in the business of taking care of a, um, an abandoned building. So um, the conversation would come back to the school board to, to figure out what the best path forward is. But uh, like I said, our commitment is to educating kids. And that same argument goes along with the town. We're not in the real estate business either. Landlords. Or the yeah, yeah. landlords. Yeah. So, uh, Catherine mentioned that the nonprofit entity has been formed. It's called Valley Hub Inc. Um, we have a 
initial seven board members will be looking for additional board members. We have officers, we have bylaws. The bylaws say specifically that the purpose of the organization is to uh, take responsibility for the building on behalf of the town, and if the town so chooses, and the uh, entity is able to accept it, to take ownership of the building. Now, right now, this entity is just getting off the ground. So we can't do that today, but there would need to be a period of time where the money gets flowing, the, the board gets developed, the capability of managing the building gets developed, which means getting a project manager, which, which we could probably get through grant funds. And so we don't want to see, if this goes forward, we don't want to see the town staff and select board all tied up in managing that building. Uh, you know, somebody's got to make sure <coughs> the plumbing works and the rent gets collected and, and everything works well in the building, but we don't envision that happening with the, the town staff. It's just not reasonable. The issue with that is only that the grant will have to be administered through the town officials, and that'll fall on the town employees. Yeah. In the end. So, in we the have end. significant money that is geared towards uh, two rivers for grant administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we are also talking about pulling out some of that money to go to the town as well. So, um, it's worked for our planning grant. Two rivers did a huge amount of administration and worked with both of you, mm -hmm. and it worked well. And then we all worked as a team. And I also want to do a shout out to Jamie Canarney. Uh, and the school district because Jamie has also been working collegially with us. We're meeting with Pat every two weeks and trying to solve every problem together. It was the school district that paid for the floodplain mitigation installation that has now happened. Um, and so, you know, it's really been a joint effort in a lot of ways. So, um, Freya, you had a, your hand up in the back there. Um, I just had a question about the money um, that you've secured, you said if, if, if it is not all spent on the high school that it would be able to be spent by the town in, is it earmarked in some way? Are there certain, I'm sure there are certain regulations around how it can be spent and what if the town decides not to do this project? Can that money be used for some other kind of economic development for the town? Okay, so this this uh, earmark, let's just call it an earmark. It's a yeah. congressional directed spending earmark, right, through Senator Sanders. And it was written to cover the cost that was provided to us through the feasibility study that was presented to the town in July 2022 through uh, uh, the Fairweather Consultants and uh, Greg Gossens, the architect. So the cost was what was given to us then, and that was presented as, the, as what we needed the money for. Mm -hmm. And that's what the money funded, based on the proposal and the cost. And we call that phase one of this repurposing project, which <laughs> literally is getting the building to a 21st century energy uh, efficiency and tenant ready, all right? It does not cover anything beyond that. What I understand, from USDA, because this is through a USDA Community Facilities CDS grant, right? Which is different, I mean, USDA has multiple uh, different grants, but this one is specific to Community Facilities CDS, all right? And so Misty Senegali uh, Senegal said uh, on our second webinar with USDA that if for some reason, you accomplish what you need to do without spending the entire 3.1 million, meaning that you accomplish everything that you set out to do in that building, mm -hmm. and you didn't spend it, no one's going to ask you to return the money. But the money goes for that. But the, the question is, if we decide not to do that, that, does that money go poof, or do we have that money to spend mm -hmm. on If you the decide not to library? do it, then I don't, I mean, I have not ask that question to USDA if we <laughs> if we have money and not do what yeah. we said we were going to do yeah. if, I, if we decide to do it another way maybe not maybe uh, preserve the whole thing or preserve some parts of it mm -hmm. does the money go away then it, I mean that's a question I that can needs specifically to be ask that question yeah. uh, in our next interaction but the very uh, essential to this 
was also the proposal for which we were repurposing the building because it has so much in the way of community services and economic development tied into it. So my guess is if you decide to do something else, it's a different conversation. It's a different conversation. And, right. you know, I'm not Senator Sanders, but the Congress passed it based on what we said we were going to do and what that's going to cost. To turn on by a new fleet of trucks. I don't think <laughs> Yeah, I don't, yeah. To start over again. Yeah. Can I, before you take another question, can I do a house cleaning thing? Um, I've got a couple of hands on Zoom, or just one, I guess, but I just want to make sure, oh, some people came in late, so I just okay. want to make sure that the people on Zoom understand that they're taking questions from the room first. Um, I'm keeping track of your hands all, and um, once the room's done with questions, then we'll move on to the Zoom questions. So I just wanted you to know. Okay, thank you. Another thing that when, it, with accepting this grant money, also puts the town into a different audit scenario. Um, and it's called the single audit, I believe. Is that what it's called? And it's, it's double the cost of what a normal audit is. Also, it's triggered so by like the bridge projects. Much, it's, right. a, it's a dollar threshold. Seven hundred fifty thousand. It's based on, and yeah. that's only in, in expenses, not in income. So it's Correct. we'd have to expense seven hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. in a year to trigger the single audit. A single audit can cost upwards of 16000 mm -hmm. If you If year. you're dispersing it that much in a year, right? Right. right. But this is going to be spread out, my yeah. guess. But, but we also have other grants yeah. as well. Yeah. That we'll be oh, it's your total. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's the, the total package. package. Yeah. It's not just that. Not just one. It's, it's it's all just so that, so. that should all be factored into the additional grants that we write. We're going to be doing a Northern Borders mm -hmm. grant in the fall. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time yeah. this has been presented to me as an additional cost, but right. costs are what grants have to, yeah. you know, list, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Deb, you had a question? So and then, so. Has the um, select board put any money in this coming budget to cover any costs? You know, if you, if you take the building over in September, um, then the costs would go to the town in terms of winter maintenance and heating, you know, keep, before right. any work is done, is that in the not time? in this, not in the current budget? No, the target the target for taking the building over at this point in time is July first, twenty twenty five. Um, the school board has drafted a preliminary uh, purchase and sale contract, just like when you bought your house, and uh, there are that is one contingency that the transition doesn't take place for a year from July first next year. And um, the school would also continue to hold the responsibility. Um, the high school has an underground oil tank, a 10,000 gallon underground oil tank that was installed when the building was built. Um, that needs to be raised. They, Vermont does not allow that anymore. Um, the school has taken on the responsibility that if there is any contamination from that, we're, we're paid out of the grant, we're going to raise that oil tank if we get to that point. But if there's any contamination, if that baby was leaking at all, then the school would take that responsibility because that would deem it a hazardous site and that, that, that just you know puts up red flags all the way around the school. So um, they'll hold the responsibility for that. And I think those are the only two contingencies that we have on it at this point in time. They're holding true to the price yeah, yes, tag well. of $1. And, $1. The, and the reason that decision was made is that the cost of $175,000 to install an interim above ground external to uh, okay. oil okay. tank to remove the 10001 was just cost prohibitive and it didn't make any sense to do it on a temporary basis. So. Jamie said, we'll cover the cost of removing it and we'll cover the cost of any potential cleanup if contamination is found. But he had just this last year removed two underground uh, tanks from other schools, including our elementary school, with no contamination found. So we've, he's feeling very optimistic that it's going to be. So, you know, when you, when you talk to the grant people, if you do amendments to the grant and they're pre-approved. I mean, you have a, a plan right now, but like say something comes up and you want to amend it, is there, in, in most federal grants, there's a process for amending and then getting permission and then yeah. changing the plan. We'll be working directly with USDA. We have a specialist who is assigned to us 
we meet with him at the school on the 17th and we'll have a number of questions to ask. But a year ago, when we didn't get the first Sanders um, you know, support money, um, Eric Law came down from USDA and uh, he said to us, well, with all good intention, you're pursuing a particular proposal, but we understand the uncertainties in, of the economy and life. He said, and so if this doesn't work out down the road, he said, we're not going to come back and ask for the money. You, we want the town to go forward with the economic development and what is going to work for this building, but the money is being granted for this proposal. So that felt, that felt to us like we are working with sympathetic people who understand the realities. We are a small town, and we're trying to move ahead into the future and do something with a building, a 33,000 square foot building, to, provide, to become an asset to the town, since it's right now being determined not usable for public education or not desired for public education. In, in, the, in the very back, then you, Lois. Yeah, can I just clarify one thing? For um, we start the budget process in the fall, so if this were to happen in the year 25, we would have time to budget money for that in the year 25, because we do that budget in the fall, going into, we finalize it sometime in December or early January to get it out to the, the town report. So we had discussed it in budget finance last year when we were doing the budget, but because there were some, so many different issues with what was going on, we didn't put any money into it this year. So this next year it won't have it. But in the fall, we will discuss having a better idea where the town's going with this. We'll add money to the budget for whatever we feel we might need for that purpose. Hi. So um, I guess, you know, a lot of... A lot of meetings that I've attended, we've, um, you know, the committee has has um, run meetings. There have been unofficial uh, meetings for kind of like PTO moms and that kind of thing, hosted by uh, younger members of the community and everything. And um, obviously, the conversation is about money, which I completely understand. Like it does all come down to money, right? But then you have to ask yourself a question: Why did Sanders? You were like, oh, it's a miracle, you know. Wow, Sanders gave us all this money, and it's like it's really not that surprising, is it? Like we live in a pretty amazing community. Um, why did these people spend four years and thousands of volunteer hours sitting on this committee, you know, talking about contamination and you know stuff that's not great, you know, coffee talk? You know, why did they invest all this time? Why did Sanders invest all this money? It's not a shock. This community is amazing. People choose this community because they see the potential in the community, um, and I, you know, I, I don't don't sell it yourself short and say that it's shocking that you know someone would invest this much in the community. Not only are we worth it, and the future is worth it, but we are going to be a landmark um, example for the dozens of schools that are now sitting empty al around the state of Vermont. They are watching this amazing, tight-knit community with this incredible committee who's done all this work, and they are watching us to see what happens. And they want us to succeed, because if we do, when we do, this could be a turning point for all these small towns in Vermont. They have these buildings sitting empty, and why not do something with them? And if we, when we succeed, when... Sanders mentioned that. Yeah, when we succeed, this could be a major turning point in Vermont's future. This is bigger than just us. And so I'm so grateful for And to bring today. that one, one step further, um, if and when this does take place, um, this committee is, is, is pretty much gone as far as they can. They will continue to be into the finance and all of that. But we would be looking for a brand new committee that will help with the renovation of that building. So all those wonderful community-minded people that have uh, knowledge of building trades, um, be ready to step forward if you, if you want this project to succeed. We need your help. Lois, back there, you had your hand up. Obtaining other grants was often mentioned. My question is, are those grants going to require a, a a sharing from the community 
And is that cost sharing going to be borne by the schools, by the school district, by the town, by the taxpayers? Who will pay for that cost sharing that often is required with a grant? Are you talking about matching Match, funds? Matching, matching funds. funds. Yeah. So, so the CBDG grant that we um, just submitted uh, does include, will be included as part of the matching funds for the Sanders. The northern borders will also be included in the matching funds. Um, so it, it's a tricky thing when you're creating the funding stack because, for instance, northern borders only has a cap of 80% of federal matching funds, but CB, but the ACCD or the Community uh, Development Board does not because it's one step removed from the federal money. So that's why we're applying for half a million dollars to ACCD, the Community Development Board, that particular grant. So, and all the grants have their own little idiosyncrasies. We have learned that they all have their own NEPA reviews. NEPA, again, is the National Environmental Protection Act. We have had two rivers, and I want to just really praise Sarah Rate, who's been fantastic in all ways supporting us. Uh, we really have an angel there. Um, so Sarah has been working with us to try to figure out the funding stack and to make sure that all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. She's working with us on this new grant. She worked with us on our original planning grant. And she'll be helping us with the Sanders grant. So, you know, we're volunteers. It's true. We're learning as we're going along, and we've learned a lot. But the support of these agencies and the people who actually really want this project to succeed has, is invaluable. So yes, there's matching funds associated, but they also, in kind hours, are included in our match. And we've had, we've already exceeded what we needed for the planning grant and volunteer hours. It's been a lot of volunteer hours. <laughs> So I'm hearing a lot of what I think of as best case scenarios. So Vic, what's the worst case scenario? What, what are the risks to the town? Because sure. it's a huge amount of money yep. in a gigantic project. So the risks would be uh, we don't get enough money to finish off the building in terms of renovation. So we're a long way towards it, but you know, we might stumble along the way which could then have a further effect on delaying the occupancy, so those interim operating costs for heat, electricity, et cetera, between when the school stops having responsibility and the town, if it takes over responsibility, there's a period, an interim period of there, which uh, if, it, if it doesn't get the kind of tenant occupancy, those operating costs still have to be paid for. So the school, or rather the town, if it were the owner, it falls back to the town. Now there are several ways perhaps to pay for it. One would be through taxes, others might be through camp, you know, fund drive or through other grants, what have you. But that's a risk. You know, I, ideally, we'd like to be able to fill the building within a year. It could be more than that. Nobody knows. Those, to me, are the two biggest risks. Um, and maybe others can think of other risks out there. That Those long -term, term. I'm sorry. That long-term, you know, occupancy is, is really the biggest risk we face, I think. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. So, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, just as my very smart daughter said, <laughs> um, we need to look into the future. And since the high school building closed, I think everybody noticed uh, less young people in our town and less activity. And I think that takes a toll. And uh, in the meantime, a lot of young people who moved from our town to other states, Colorado, Utah, and so forth, are coming back, especially now that a lot of companies provide remote work. Our youngest son is a data analyst working in Boston. But he comes here and he can work from home, but that's not ideal. A lot of times for a lot of people, 
because as we know, the uh, internet service, like up the hill, we live up the hill, and it's like we have two lives, but Daniel comes home, it's like, Mom, this is, I cannot work here. I'm like, well, <laughs> there's not that I can do, because even if we wanted to, um, CB, what is it, FC, that's the fiber. <laughs> they, they, would, they quote us $9,000 to get, to connect us from, you know, Brook Street. So that's not feasible, um, at least for now, <laughs> unless, uh, Daniel pays, pays for it. <laughs> so that's a lot of people. We have a lot of interest in office space. Mostly because after COVID, as we all know, a lot of people can work remotely. And that's what we need. We need an influx of people, business people, young people, all, all kinds of all, all age people who want to be here and work here having their own space, not like in their, in their old bedroom, you know, in a, with a limited internet service, but in a building that's like comfortable and, you know, with other, other business people sharing the space and so forth. Yeah, the co-working spaces are successful yeah. because they share costs. Yeah. Nancy, you had your hand up? <coughs> well, I'm just wondering if with all of the work that's going on, we don't seem to have heard too much about what it costs to just maintain that building, even now. Yeah, uh, uh, Jamie's estimate was $60,000 a year. And, it, and that co covers what? Heat, electric, maintenance, um, internet, insurance. I suppose. Insurance. Insurance. Lawn mowing, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, all just the, the routine cost of managing the building with its clunky old heating system that doesn't work properly because it, its controls are <laughs> out of control. Now, um, one question that you said you're meeting with the the, um, the money people on the 17th next month. Yeah. Um, yes, dear. One question that I'd be interested to know is if um, we go through this and we renovate the building with this money, is there any timeline that, that puts a limit on at what point we could sell it to a nonprofit or we could sell it to uh, some company that wants to do it? It'll be a more attractive building once it's yeah. approved. I, I have that from our, our April 4th meeting. It's an open question we haven't gotten an answer yet. That's a okay. question we haven't gotten an answer to yet. Okay. So yes, we Because you know, that would be good yes. to know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But we've, we've had two USDA webinars. One, the first one, which you had the same day on April 14th, we're all excited because we might get our questions answered. 600 we're, people. We're one of 600 people oh. on the web with the Assistant uh, um, uh, Secretary of Agriculture just saying congratulations. <laughs> um, and then we had a later one uh, at the state <laughs> level, which was a little more informative, but not to the level of specificity like this question. So our next opportunity is uh, we've been uh, given a designated uh, liaison from the uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, USDA office, uh, and we're going to meet with him at the site on the 17th of May, and then we'll get into more detailed questions. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's where we'll get an answer to I think one. his name is Arthur Gutier. Alex. Alex. Right? I think it's Alex. Alex. Oh, Alex. That's right. Alex Gutier. Yeah. Annie? Um, <clears throat> as the town considers this vote, um, and I would would imagine that they'll get into the place where they start to take it very seriously and maybe seriously consider the purchase. Um, have you started to put some um, thought to who the general contractor would be for the project? Because it's not really a project that's appropriate for a we're community. Thinking, we're thinking about that right a now. A community board. I think it really requires a commercial focus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so has any of that outreach started yet? Well, we're working with um, Greg Gossens, who does this. He's um, very experienced in all aspects of this, and so... Where does he, who does he represent? He, he, he's his own firm. He's the architect who worked on the feasibility study, mm -hmm. and um, he's working with us now. He'll, he, we got an um, extension to the planning grant, another $10,000 for him to be working to on the architectural work, and so we, and we And I've been in touch with uh, some of the fellow uh, Gifford board members who work in finance around the state looking for suggestions for developers for the project, and really commercial real estate brokers, because 
You're right. I mean, we're a bunch of volunteers. This is totally new. Yeah. This is a big project. We're looking yeah. for professionals. Yeah. yeah you and if you have suggestions, mm -hmm. yeah. you should submit them. Well, I, I just uh, was thinking that in, you know, in the process of this, it would seem like you would need at least three, at minimum, contractors weighing in on what they actually do think the true cost of this particular phase of renovation should be. We're, we're looking for a makes upgraded um, um, estimate right I, now. Yeah, I mean, I just want to suggest that that is probably a critical component of the decision making around yeah. the town's yay or nay, because it could come in twice that amount or three times or maybe even four times that amount. So well, I think it's an important thing to really understand before. I, I think there's a couple of things. There's this this price is 3.1 is for the phase one, okay? Which is not building out the tenant spaces. That's a whole nother phase two, right? So yeah, and, and Greg is working on um, more cost estimates for us based on current prices. And that's going to be reflected in the additional grants that, that are being written. Yeah. No, I know I I'm following everything you're doing really closely and just wondering, you know, who have the contractors been identified yet and is there a way to expedite um, some sort of a quote for when when you say contract, you're talking about a general contract? Yeah, or? it I think just who is who's gonna be the G C for the project and who will be the company that will, you know, basically um, you know, implement everything that is hoped for in this well, process. Yeah, there will probably be though. multiple yes. contractors depending on I what phase of it is. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a clerk of the works, mm -hmm. uh, and there's going to be a general project manager uh, that will be working right. with all the contractors. Yes. And this is complicated. Yeah. I do know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, to be just to confirm something for me, all the figures that we're talking about all derive from the uh, uh, Black, River, Black River study? Correct. Because that was a pretty limited study in terms of how much they paid them and that they did several other buildings at the same time. So, uh, and will you have the new, the, the kind of thing that Annie's talking about, we have that new estimate before people vote on it? Mm. He's know. working on it right now, no. Greg is. We, he, two weeks ago or more, he's yes. been asked to do that. He's meeting with, at the school, I think May 8th, with Dick, Dick yeah. Robson. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah just so, so just to clarify, what Rob's talking about is, and. Uh, the school board retained an architecture firm called Black River Design, based in Montpelier, to take uh, an assessment of all three of the school buildings, the high school and the two elementary schools in the combined school district, and to come up with cost estimates to renovate them and put in, into condition for either education or some other general unnamed purpose. And they, they did that. They did a visitation to the building. They came up with estimates based on the site visit and cost per square foot in other projects and came up with a, with numbers uh, including the cost of demolition uh, fast forward to 2022 uh, Greg Gossens uh, the, another firm based in Montpelier architecture firm reviewed that study visited the building and and uh, agreed with what was put into that study and then updated based on uh, in the you're right, the inflationary factor <coughs> since then that they've experienced in their own shop. And that's where the additional 35% on top of Black River came from. So that takes us to 2022. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, going forward to a, a construct, construction year of perhaps 2025, you have to boost inflation again. And then I think as Annie's suggesting, you know, is there another source of information that could give you perhaps even more accurate information whether it's better or worse, but it you know it'd be worth it'd be worth knowing that before we make a commitment as a town. So I think that's very good advice. I, I really think it's like to me it's like buying an old house, and I, a lot of people in this town have bought old houses, and you know a lot of times there's surprises. In them. Yeah. So that Black River study was a pretty I mean in my, in my mind fairly limited study in, in terms of the amount of money they paid them and what, how that was spread around. Uh, I would hope that before the town was going to vote to buy it, would have a much more more updated and, and clear sense of just what the condition of the place yeah, yeah. was and what it would cost yeah. to fix it. Yeah, and the, the, the more recent architect, did, they put a, a, a 
contingency factor in of some X percent, which is typical for a project like this. But, you know, <coughs> when you get an actual bid, uh, but, you know, to get a bid, you'd have to have architectural drawings. So, you know. But, but that's that. sort of what I'm talking about. Yeah. All these various studies, they're not, they've been fairly cheap. And for a 33,000 square foot building, all those complexities, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just think you want to have pretty clear, you know, you know, because you know, I've talked, it's all about money to me. And it's a huge project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like anybody who's ever lived in an old house, you know, you start looking into it, and so, you know, there's just things in there you didn't know about. Yeah. Well, we have had VHB uh, looking into it. Uh, we just got through a very comprehensive environmental study of the building and the grounds, and uh, in that umbrella uh, uh, assessment, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Ray wrote in other things that are not normally umbrella, hazardous materials, and et cetera, and there was nothing found in the building uh, that raised to regulatory action. So we do we learned that on January or 18th, the 31st, we hear back from Caitlin Bain from the Department of uh, Environmental Conservation, and she said, "Wait a second, but the arsenic uh, standards are being elevated, and you need to send your contractor back." Turns out it was nothing, and the building was on third base of the baseball diamond, and that's been done, and it did not raise to re regulatory action. So I think we should all feel good that this building passed the environmental assessment. And that, by the way, Black River wasn't so sure about. And we did it. It took a couple of years because we're dealing with, you know, a, a shortage of consultants and um, just the time. It, it took two years to go through that whole thing. And I think it's been difficult for everybody to wait and wait and wait for results. But we got them finally. We finally got them, and we're expecting the certificate of completion any day now. I think Zoom is going to be afterwards. I, Robert, Frank. Robert, I think you came in a little bit late. I'm not sure that you heard the announcement that they're addressing questions in the room first, and then we'll get to Zoom. Well, you know, Kristen, you're not the, the controller of democracy. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Robert, that's a, the rules that we set down. This is how we're conducting this meeting because it's a, a large group, a full room. We're going to deal with the room and then we'll go to Zoom. It's, that's how we set it from the beginning. If you were to have been here at the beginning, you would have heard that. So the um, woman in the doorway. Oh, no. Yeah, they just made up a long no, time ago. Then you, okay. Um, Rob, you asked about the worst case scenario. Stand up, maybe. So they can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? No. Oh, it's going to take a while. <laughs> um, it up. Oh, jeez. Um, you're asking about the worst case scenario, and I just, when I think of that, I'm thinking, okay, we've got two options that are the worst case scenario. One is that we don't do anything at all, and we just watch the building deteriorate over time. Uh, the other one is that we um, we demolish it for a million bucks or thereabouts, and that price can go up too. And um, we all pay for that. That will go on our taxes. That will be a 20, at least a 20 year bond that we all will pay for, and we won't get anything out of it. So we'll pay for it in that regard and get nothing. Um, or we can watch the building just dissolve into the ground, which means that whole space can't be used for anything. And it becomes a danger zone because it's right next to the elementary school. And we just, we've talked about this many times, we don't want to end up with the same scenario that Hancock is dealing with, which is a deteriorating building that isn't able to be, you know, appreciated by anybody because it's falling apart and it looks awful. And this committee has been together for four years, working really hard, and there's so many really legitimate concerns here, and so much talent that is required to really move this forward to what the town could use. 
So if there's anybody in this group or on Zoom or in town that you know about who has a skill that can come forward and be part of moving this forward, because it is going to take a lot of people to pull it off. And it takes a lot of hours. And so far, what I've seen, being part of this committee for many, many years, is that anything that comes up, any of the questions that you have here have already been thought of by this group and are being addressed by this group. You've got some pretty talented people on this committee who are really digging deep to find the answer so you can know what you're voting on when, you come, when this comes to vote. Nobody wants anybody to walk in and scratch their head and say, I don't know what the hell this is about, but I don't like the feel of it. Or I think this is great and I want to be part of it. We want you to go in with facts. And so therefore, this committee is really digging deep to find that information, to get it out to the public. But gosh, there is so much to do here. And so anybody who has any kind of talent or interest, bake a cookie. I mean, just come, feed us in the meetings, whatever. <laughs> but come and be part of it, because we want it to be part of the community right from the get-go. We don't want to wait until the doors open before everybody floods in and says, oh, this is fabulous. Come be part of it. Come join and do help out with the work, because heaven knows we could use you. So worst case scenarios, we end up with a building that's rotting in place, or we pay a million bucks in our taxes for the next 20 years for nothing, to have it carted away. That's my worst case um, scenario. There's a question in the doorway, then we'll go to you for a minute. Hi, I just want to thank the committee, um, the Repurposing Committee, for doing all the hard work for our community. I think it's forward thinking about the future of our town and where we are going um, as a community. Um, I do just want to remind everyone right now that as of now, the Rochester Stockbridge Unified District owns this school building. Yeah. And they are not meant to be landlords. They are meant to be educating our kids, talking about education. So something with this vote, I really want to make sure that we're either having it in the language of the vote, of, that we present it to the town, that you will buy back this building, and then maybe a second part to saying that we're going to take on these projects. I'm concerned, and I think the project is has a lot of support, but I am concerned about if it fails, we're going back to putting this back onto our side, the Rochester Stockbridge Unified District's budget, which, again, we're paying for it, but we're asking Stockbridge to pay for it, and we've been asking them to pay for their share for the last four years, and I think that has been a problem for our school boards in communication between the two towns to educate our kids in a more efficient manner um, because of this unnecessary burden of, um, of cost to Stockbridge. I think our town created the high school in uh, sometime in the 70s. I think it's our responsibility as our town to take it off our budget and put it to the town regardless of what we do with it. It is our problem. It is, I think, a benefit to our town to do this project. And um, I just want it to be, to be understood that we really need to get this also off of, you know, to the town and not for the school, school, school board. The town, too, is not a landlord, so right. we're in the same boat as you are with that. Yeah. True. And True. So, so this is a dilemma for the community. It's not really something that we're trying to push on one way or the other. The other thing with this building was it was a design from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Back know, when yeah. they built this thing, it was 1971 they started mm -hmm. the project. Um, I sat with my parents and listen to them bitch about this thing from day one <laughs> at the supper table every night. Uh, my mother was on the, tr she was the treasurer of this building down there when they originally built it. The, s the southern design on this building, oh, the, the furnace is in the south end and the big part of the building is in the north end. So whatever you do there, 
it seems to me a smart move to spend some of this money would be to move the heating system to the central part of the building to get it so that you can heat the stupid thing as cheaply as possible. So, I mean, there, there are so many things that can go wrong when you start renovating this building, and I agree with Rob. Whenever you tear into something, it's going to be an issue, and this building is no exception. So whatever we do, regardless of how we do it, it's going to co be costly. And there's going to be funds that we're going to have to come up with regardless of how much grant money we have. Because there's going to be unforeseen things that we're going to see that we're not going to have money for. And to budget for this project would be a nightmare because you just, I don't think you can budget for something like this. I think Personally. Just, really, I'd just like to just follow up. Just my concern with that, though, is Stockbridge didn't vote to build the high school, and Stockbridge, just right. look at, and Stockbridge also right. doesn't have a voice in this it, vote. And Rochester paid for this building when they built it. It was bonded back then, and we were sole owner, and I agree that whatever happens down there, it should be the Rochester taxpayer yeah, that deals my, with it. Yes. It's not Stockbridge's issue. But if if some of that building is, say, we decide that the town decides they want to uh, maybe raz part of it and keep part of it and keep it as a school, then Stockbridge would be owner to that piece of that. And that's the way I would view that. Oh, I can, that I can as see it. that being very like, agreeable. Yeah. Can you identify yourself? Um, Megan Payne. I actually sat on the Rochester Stockbridge School Board for a bunch of years and actually through the study committee with Frank and... Rob, I believe you're on the study committee as well. It's a bunch of years ago, but. Um. I, yeah, I just want to follow up on, on something that Rob and Annie were talking about in terms of the reliability of the cost estimates and relate that to the timing of the vote. But as Catherine noted, we have five years to spend this money. We don't have to make this vote tomorrow. Okay? Mm -hmm. We have plenty of time to get into uh, reliable cost estimates, <coughs> get them up to date, and have numbers that everybody can look at and say this is the best uh, estimate of the real cost that, that you can get. And that's going to take a little time, but I think what I want to convey is there's no need to rush to this vote. By the same t token, the school has been very patient about this and, and needs to be able to get out from under it <laughs> at some point. You know, they, the, the purchase and sale agreement draft says you know can take up to as far as uh, July 1 of 2025. And I don't think we want to do anything that would blow past that. So the, the select board has yet to define a date for this vote, and I know wants to get all this input before making that call. But I, I just want to uh, make sure that we allow ourselves enough time to get as reliable a cost estimate as can be got. Can I just follow uh, up? I just want to say something. Can I just follow up with my comment to the whole thing is that, and to many that's been expressed already, and absolutely 1,000% to the credit of Catherine's uh, due diligence and the board and her ability to navigate all of these things and getting the money thus far. It is happening because we have a history of being able to get projects done. And I think the rigor of the conversation is very important at this particular point in time because I do think this is how it will get done. And um, I don't say any of those things to as a barrier to this project being done, but actually, the more due diligence around this particular financial part, the more we will galvanize support at the statewide level. Mm -hmm. Because we will be seen to be doing it correctly. And so I feel like you've set um, a really good pace for that. And it's just a matter of us um, figuring out the way to keep in pace with that. And so to my previous point, the right contractor, the right GC, the appropriate budget so that we really do understand what we're going into because I think it would not be good for this project to be stymied halfway through. Right. It would be the worst, that for me is the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. is to actually see that get shuttered, no progress, and the town then looking at something that's half finished. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if that's a that's my worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> that really is. And so... A quick quick follow-up to that, yeah. too. Phase two. You know, it, the other thing I think would be helpful, the, the same uh, general contractors updating number, and I know you don't have all the information at all, really, as to what the build-out is going to be, although I think I read somewhere that you had 5,000 feet um, projected for one 
you know, for a particular 1,000 feet here, 1,000 feet there. It'd be great if, if, if there were a scenario, you know, not concrete, but, you know, we think mm -hmm. we would anticipate, you know, four 1,000-foot yeah. spaces, a 5,000-foot space, yep. and find out what it would cost, again, a, a, an educated estimate as to what the build-up, yeah. what phase two mm -hmm. will cost. Mm -hmm. We already have that. a breakdown yes, of the there child was care a, center. Yes. Bill, there was a plan. And um, we're getting those figures for other components as we are asking for letters of intent. And I do believe that we have to go a little further than letters of intent as far as the block grants concerned. They, they know we don't own the building, and so that makes it difficult for lease, but you can have a hypothetical lease so that there's at least an understanding to the tenants of what's going to be expected in terms of, you know, square footage. And it's been an interesting process. It's only going to get more interesting. That really is kind of our number one priority right now is to work with the tenants, the potential tenants, and to bring in other tenants. The co-working space, as somebody mentioned, I think it was, um, yeah. Asia. And uh, it's true. I mean, the, the outfit over in Randolph is very successful because they, they share expenses that individual businesses by themselves cost quite a bit. But when you create that pool, um, you share expenses and it makes um, it a more affordable thing, so especially for people who don't necessarily want uh, an office seven days a week, you know, so that there can be that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, at this point, I'm talking about the, the cost of the build-out, or is that... The cost of the build-out is part of it. Like I said, we have, we have a, a cost breakdown now for the child care center, right? So we actually have numbers. So I'm working on that grant separate to break, because there's a lot of money right now in the state to support child care. We learned in the pandemic that it's an enormous economic factor. If a, if a parent can't work because they don't have child care, that's a problem. So we've done multiple surveys of the, of the wider community, and there is a, a strong interest in the child care center. Only we're, Maureen Young, who's married to Jeff Gephardt, who um, teaches uh, early childhood for the community college, uh, she, she's creating the concept of an early child care center that will also be a workforce development for people in uh, early childhood and possible satellite uh, for the community college in the building, as well as wraparound family services, mental health, and so forth. So we're looking at partnerships, partnerships to create some of this. Um, so that, those partnerships will, will help pay the cost of the building? Well, sustaining yeah. the building, that's right. No, 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 I'm not talking about sustaining. I know, you're talking about the actual I'm, I'm building talking, I'm talking about getting it so that, that space can be rented. Okay, so you're talking about building out the spaces. And space I, to building it out. Right, and so, like and get, I said, I've got the... You've got, got the, the 3.1 million for the envelope. Yes. And, and now, my, I, I think it'd be great to know and I know it's a, uh, an educated estimate what phase two will cost. So we're starting to work on phase two. I'm, uh, I have the funds for the, I mean, I have the, the figures for building out the child care center. And the, the, that is really my intention with the Northern Borders grant is to put that money hopefully up to a million dollars towards the building out of these spaces. That's what we're working on at the same time that we're working on this. We're looking to the future because we need to build out those spaces. And I would suggest you know, the thing about this building, Bill, the thing about this building in its 19 dollars. I'd like to, um, Burma's been very patient over here yeah. and her arm's getting tired, so I'd like to let her. Talk. I just, uh, I, now I have a two part question. One, what, what is the latest you might consider having the vote for? this project for the town to vote. What's the latest date? I know you said July something, 2025. That's well, like the back in, according to so the, the purchase and so the, the draft purchase date. and sale. Yeah, but yeah. that's really, um, but this would need to happen much sooner than that, I so think. What yeah. we're, we're looking at sometime this summer, I think. So sometime this summer, the town will vote. That's what we're, 
we're and working be, towards. Uh, That's why we're gathered all right. here to really it'll be a ballot vote. have the information out there. Okay, yes. now yeah. my other part of the question is the select board's here, Terry's here, there's a lot of knowledgeable people here. What do you foresee in the next five to ten years that the town is going to have to spend money on that will impact our taxes? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you give it a give a roughly about things other than, other than the sewer yeah. system because and things that Frank posted on April fourth? The school has their own septic system. You got to consider that fifty years old. <coughs> it's not on the town. No, it's no, not. No. And the town no. can't take it. So, when it was an active high school, was the septic system? At risk of failing? I have no idea. I did nothing to do with that. <laughs> because no one has mentioned this, the high school septic system in terms of it being threatened. Oh, they're not. Are you mentioning it now? No. Yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, it hasn't been used either for three, four years. So I mean, you know, you need it hasn't to, been that long since the tanks have and been I, pumped. I have no idea. I tried getting them years ago. To build the tanks up, and we would check them every year, like we do the town ones. And the guy that was in charge of maintenance didn't want nothing to do with it, so I dropped it. Okay, put it on the list. Just put it on the list. But I think you're gonna have to dig some test holes and see what's going on. But it's, it's probably fair to think that the septic field got the same attention as the rest of the building. Yeah, zero. Yeah, zero. It got pumped on a regular basis during the 80s it was and 90s. I will say that. Yeah, yeah. it's been a great job. Yeah, it's also been <laughs> But it did, but I don't think before or recently. Recently, yeah. I don't know. We need to check on that because we did have septic work done. We had. On the elementary school. We need to check. They did on the elementary. I would need to check. They each have their own. Thanks, Amy. Yep. Oh, we'll need to check. Yeah. I just wanted to say to Bill, you know, I understand that you're separating what the tenant income is going to be from building out the spaces. And I'm trying to, maybe I was confusing in my response, but we are thinking about that now. We are talking to tenants. We are getting what their cr uh, criteria is and then figuring out what the cost of creating those spaces are. And there's a grant that will be submitted in the fall that will be geared towards that. Jeff, you've been raising your hand back there for a while. I would think that before a tenant or a possible tenant signs the dotted line to rent space or lease space in that building, that there would be some sort of architectural rendering oh, yeah. or drawing trying to show what this finished space might look like. Absolutely. Because it's really ratty right now. It'll be required, actually. Okay. <coughs> and we have money built into the grant for that. Great. And we'll be looking out That's of state. That's part of the Sanders money. We'll be looking at out-of-state possibilities rather than just local people renting that space because so I don't think done pretty good. there's enough people locally to rent all that space and cover the operating costs for a year. Um, that's just my thought, but it would be nice to have their names on the dotted line before we spend all this money in purchasing this property. That's probably not possible because the code is coming up. We would agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> names on dotted line. I was just thinking before we start getting multiple questions from everyone here, maybe like the Zoom people want to be able to say something we're since we're talking about that. Okay. <laughs> Can I just ask one question about the design aspect of it? Um, whether that, whether the town could consider, or should the town people be thinking about um, an actual de separate consideration for the design and um, some sort of an agreement about the design direction? Um, so, you know, you have one architectural firm that you've uh, that you've hired right now to look at the practical, uh, you know. Sep, you know, division of that space, um, I would imagine that that might impact some of the exterior uh, workings of that building as well. And I just think that it could, that there's good ways of doing it, 
and maybe not such good ways of doing it. And it just seems to me that it should be a consideration um, for the townspeople to agree upon certain design directions. Like, I was, I was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just concerns about aesthetic, aesthetic. I'm talking and function. About an, an, Form and function. Uh, something that um, manages to transform that building um, in a way that we would feel proud and happy. <laughs> and also, you know, that it's moving in the direction of something that has flexibility should one entity decide that, in fact, they don't want to renew their lease after two mm. years or five years or ten mm -hmm. years, but that we have some design control over this. And I think it's oftentimes a thing that is not thought about or considered the minor aspect, but actually I think it's the major aspect of this in terms of a building that we could agree is something that, you know, feels like it has transcended what it is right now and moves us into the future in a really good way. So the 50 well, years like from now, we're not worrying about what Frank just talked about <laughs> when this yeah. building was originally built yeah. and designed from a Georgia architect. Yes, I understand. Yeah, and again, it's, you know, it's three, again, it's looking at multiple different directions and doing that due diligence around, you know, pretty much all of this. This is why this will take such a long time, because one, there is so much involved. One thing I'm hearing here tonight, and I think, um, I think this is a, a vote in itself yes. on how to proceed forward if mm -hmm. the com community is interested in moving this project forward that should be the first <laughs> vote that we have as a town and then we move to to buy it if that vote goes through that way i don't know how anybody feels about that but that's what i'm hearing from everybody because if you vote yes or no to buy the school are you voting yes or no to for the plan going forward or not. So I think it's a two-tiered question that we need to address. I'm, that's what I'm hearing. I don't know I about mean, we're really getting into folks, the weeds but, here now. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought I heard you all saying when you were setting up this meeting was that this we were not going to accomplish in one meeting by no. any means. Right. Yeah. We the are, concerns and yeah. the considerations that are emerging from this one meeting. So, I, you know, how many meetings are you considering to and don't you think it might be a good idea to start separating out and identifying um, what the meetings might address going into the future? Frank, why don't you do a show of hands now and see what you I, I don't really want to do that. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not a good thing to do. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, wait, we've got one more question in the room. Yeah, just in, uh, I think your, your last statement goes a bit to this, but the what I'm trying to figure out is what actually are we likely to vote on this summer? Because part of what's holding things up, too, is like we, we can't go get a general contractor bid until you know who owns the building. Right, right, and right. you can't get tenants in or to sign letters of intent unless you know who owns the building. Right. So at some point, we have to vote on shall the town yeah. own right. the building. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then you're correct. There's all these other details to work out. But, but at some point, we have to vote yes or no. Yeah, right. And that's, that's what we're trying to address here. That'll be the first vote yeah. this summer, as you're saying. It, 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 and then there'll it, be some possibly, other vote after that about possibly, I, the plan. You know, I don't know. What I'm hearing is I think we need to vote whether we want to pursue the plan first. And then we uh, vote to whether or not to buy the building, uh, or, or vice versa, whichever way you want to do it. But I, I think it, I think what people have been asking is a lot of detailed questions about how the plan will get rolled out, right. assuming that the town had already bought the building, <laughs> which actually we haven't even taken that step. So I, I'm one of these people where I'm like, I want to go, I want to do it. I'm interested in all these questions, and I, I agree there's risk involved if things go wrong along the way, but we can't do anything right. until... That's also made it much more complicated in terms of navigating these grants right. because it has to be the municipality that be has been... Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so let's... Uh, set, uh, we want to... Okay, there's two more, and then we're going to start bringing in some oh. Zoom input. Oh, okay, I, if we don't buy the building, what's, what would happen? It's, oh. Uh, it stays with the school. It's a school building, so it would just stay with the school. Walter. So, uh, it just, it just so that, though, the, the best opportunity for anything positive to happen to this building is through grant money, which is not accessible to the school. Yeah. So for the best opportunity for this building to, to move forward and be a community, anything of, of an asset to the community, we really need to access these funds. Just a little bit of historical perspective. 
I've been paying taxes here since nineteen sixty seven. You're dating yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's Don't all right. Be careful. I'm pretty old. <laughs> so, and and there's a difference between what I'm hearing here. There's hope. Half of you think that you hope it's going to go away, and the other half think it's going to happen. I, I choose to be optimistic because I've lived in this town for so long, and I watched a two-person company called Oatmeal Studio succeed wildly in this town with a lot of employment. Advanced illumination. At one point, we had Conceptions Unlimited, which started three or four people in the little red schoolhouse on, on Brook Street. It grew to 80, 80 employees in this town. We have an LED, we have a number of LED companies here. You're not gonna identify every single tenant every time. If we can raise, and I don't mean to be glib, if we can raise a million and a half dollars to restore Pierce Hall, we can raise a million dollars on top of what we can get from all our friends in the government who we've been supporting all these years. <laughs> That's the end of my editorial. <laughs> Kristen, you want to start bringing in yes, some I, questions? I would love to. Thank you for so, your patience. I, so. Oh, Kristen? Yes, thank, yes? Kristen? Yeah, Martha. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if, if it would be okay if I mention something quickly, I would like to do that. One of the things I haven't heard mentioned this evening uh, is another reason why, in my opinion, we should um, keep the building and, you know, and, and um, uh, keep it in good, uh, you know, renovate it, whatever. Um, I've been a longtime member of the White River Valley Players for almost 40 years now, and um, that building has the only auditorium in the whole valley area. And not only is it used by the White River Valley players for theater things, and of course by the school, um, but it's also been used for town meetings and all you know other town um, reasons. So that auditorium is is a real asset to that building. It's something that's um, you know not you know that it's something that hasn't I haven't heard mentioned, but I just think it's important. So just thought I'd mention it. And thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go now. Um, I've been keeping track. And Andrew, is it first? I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. You poor thing. You've had your hand up for over an hour. You are saying that right. All right. <laughs> go ahead. It's my fault for not being there. So. Um, well, I'm Andrew Fersh. Uh, I am uh, very soon to be 26 Brook Street resident. Uh, and people love hearing from the new guy in town, so I'll be really brief uh, and just say that I am one of the, the people who is very excited about signing that dotted line to reserve space to offer programming for uh, middle and high school students. Uh, I will be an educator in town and have run a nonprofit for a number of years uh, where I offer programming to middle and high school students as well, so I'll be teaching elementary school, uh, but would love that opportunity. Uh, moving from the Portland area, I have been very involved in conservation commissions and the open space acquisition committee. And uh, I would just say that like this to me, I mean, I, I know that there are a million factors that need to be considered and, and I agree with the optimist view of, well, if there are enough people who are willing to work hard enough that anything is possible and that I would be one of those people who's more than happy to volunteer of my time and uh, my wife and daughter as well. And it's just a great opportunity to let like democracy be a democracy where residents get to make the choice about what happens to their own town. And I think that's really beautiful. And then the final thing I'll say is uh, my dad originally from Iowa, and so he was a big Field of Dreams guy. And if you, if you build it, they will come. Uh, it's easy to say and say like, well, this could go wrong and that could go wrong, but you'll never know if you never did it and and if it's done well and, and everyone's very intentional about it, uh, which I've, you know, as someone who's, who's learning about it more and more, I'm very impressed with what everyone's doing. Um, and I also, I'm done, but my wife, who's a, a writer, just wanted to jump on real quick and, and say it. Thank you all. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, we're so excited to join on your community, as is our three-year-old daughter. And I just wanted to quickly say that um, I also feel so excited about the potential for this project. I'm a professional writer. I have my first book coming out next year. I lead a lot of writing workshops um, and events, and I collaborate with um, musicians and artists. And um, I would also be so excited to rent a space in the center. And we're also just, with a young child, excited for any and all family and community opportunities for her as she grows up. So thank you so much. I uh, look forward to meeting you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the next one that I had on my list was Justin. Um, I didn't have a last name, and I believe that he has left the meeting. So after that, um, Anne, Jeanette, and Lemac, if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. Um, I just had a quick question. No one's talked about the flooding issue, and... I'm, even though there's some um, plans for mitigation, I don't know how you hold back an ocean. So assuming that it's going to flood again, and, and we're talking about investing you know, upwards of several million dollars, if it's not three, it's six or 12, um, and we know it's gonna flood again, I just, I guess I'd love to hear more conversation about that. Yeah, so um, we worked with an engineering firm to, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, du Bois and King, a local engineering firm, to look at that very issue because it, it came up <clears throat> not only because of the practical matter of there has been a flood there, but also the building sits partially in the floodplain. The, the location that is below the 100-year floodplain is right in front of the stage of the auditorium. If you think about the, the, when you're in the building, you go down, it's the raked uh, seating and down in front of the stage. That's the lowest point of the building. That's vulnerable. And it's the 100 year floodplain comes to about with a threshold a little bit higher than that. And the solution that was calculated by the engineering company was to install flood resistant uh, doors. And I say door in a general sense, is what it is is there's a frame on both sides of the door. And it was just installed this week in the auditorium uh, emergency exit. And then there's a, a steel uh, sheet that goes down into that and it makes a watertight seal. And it's about three feet high off the ground, so it's it's well above the 100-year flood plain level. And uh, it's to be installed in two places, there and also underneath the band room where there's the double door uh, sort of garage area for the tractor Storage and so area. forth. And that solution has been approved by the state and by... Uh, FEMA, it's being FEMA. installed according yeah. to FEMA standards. So that's what I would say in response. But it's a, it's a rip. We know it's going to flood again someday, and, and that's been installed. Around the building, not in it. Yeah. Hopefully, and that's an there. approach that's actually used quite a bit in areas that are prone to flooding, such as Florida. It's a uh, that's a standard use now. Those yeah. flood gates, basically, is what they are. Okay. It's but what the, they use in Venice. <laughs> yeah. So the, the flooding um, issue and potential is also a reason why housing is off the table as an option for the building. Right. And then the last, per are you, you want, want to go on? Yeah. The um, last person on my list was Robert Franks. No. If you, you still oh, there, Robert? Hold on, I'm he. I'm admitting him back in on his computer. Okay. It's all you, Robert. If you're with us. I'm unmuting him, asking him to unmute. He's not accepting. So, it's up to you. Going once. <laughs> Thank you all for um, your concern and your input and excitement and attention. And this is um, not the only meeting we're going to have about this. We just figured we needed to, to start and get these topics out in the open and, and, and share the information. and and gather more questions. So um, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.